Someone asked me, did I take notes and prepare for today's class? And, uh, <clears throat> not that I can give you an instruction that is not to be done, but I can share with you before I begin the class my, in brief form, the long full format would take for one week, but <laughs> we don't have this time today. Um, so, <clears throat> I, I had been in India before uh, the Krishna Consciousness movement and had a little dabbling uh, experience with Hindi and Telugu. And I mentioned it to Sri the Prophet very briefly, that I knew a little. Uh, he remembered everything. It was very interesting. Hmm. So we were traveling with him in uh, South India. In 1972, there was a program uh, uh, set up by Kiriraj Maharaj along with Ashutananda Swami and uh, Gopal Bhatt. Uh, a few others. So we went to that and then we went to the ashram of Sri Prabhupada's very dear friend and god brother B.B. Puri Maharaj. And then B.B. Puri Maharaj was there and my god brothers and god sisters. And we have to take the picture of this kind in the beginning was to be three weeks senior was the huge thing. Like, and I told that amongst a group of the old uh, persons in the movement, and they say, why three weeks, three hours, three minutes, someone said. <laughs> no, it was a respect, you know, respect. It was, it was, and it was from the heart, not that it was ordered, it was all, you see, they have been there, even though I had been practicing. So they were there, and uh, Srila Prabhupada, he didn't prepare me, and he had me sit by his side, called me over, and he called me over, and he says, you give the lecture now, in Telugu. And the whole audience, there was a huge audience of, there were 500 people, but they were only Mataji, you know, another men came, men and not so interested in hearing spiritual talks, Prabhupada commented. So I was thinking, oh, you know, Bibi Puri Maharaj, who's so perfect in Telugu, and then Srila Prabhupada, and, I seen your god brothers and what am I going to talk about? So it, it, I struggled on, and as I struggled through the Prabhupada, trying to kind of getting the gist of what I was saying, was supplying me Sanskrit words to pop into the Telugu because in Telugu, Puhu Rulumu, if you say, you know, Nischat, Nischatam, Nischatamu. You add the move to the room. Then uh, that passed, and then I, uh, <clears throat> another time, a few years later, just after the opening of the Krishna Balaram temple, <clears throat> I had been very sick, and Sri Prabhupada said, You take some time off from <laughs> Delhi and you come and rest up in Vrindavan uh, for a few days. So I was just resting. 
and the banging on the door was uh, this Prabhupada's secretary. He said, Srila Prabhupada wants to see you at once. So, <laughs> at one, yeah, he, uh, when Srila Prabhupada wanted to see me, it always was at once for me. But that was his mood. <laughs> he was being a good servant. So I went and I went to temple and there was Srila Prabhupada in the middle and flanking him were almost all of the pandas and uh, pujari, you know, temple heads of Vrindavan and like 15, 25 of his guide brothers, and then, you know, behind him, you know, were the sannyasis and Prabhupada's disciples. And so then Srila Prabhupada, he went up to him and he says, now you give a talk in Hindi. <laughs> Little difficult to talk about. And now I think you tell it, sorry. Uh, so I had these two experiences, foreign language transactions with Srila Prabhupada. So then we were at the Hyderabad farm, so a few years later, um, sometime early December '76, and Sri the Prophet called me in his room and he said, "Tonight you talk in Telugu." So he's a Telangana person, and I can speak some Telugu, but it's more not so much spiritual, and I hadn't had any chance in between to speak Telugu. So it's some you know many years from my training. So then I thought, you know, at least this time, I'll know some words. So I was just randomly thinking of words and looking them up in the dictionary, in Telugu, English dictionary, Mr. Brown's, there's only, there was only one, you know, very difficult to find, English, Telugu, Telugu, English. So I was looking randomly and Harisari Prabhu came in and he said, Srila Prabhupada wants to know what you're doing. So this is, this is a common thing. Srila Prabhupada always wanted to know what we were doing. It was not like, okay, you know, you can slack off. And when I, when he would come to Delhi, there was a, we had a very small center right near Karna Place, Tordamal Lane. And Srila Prabhupada's room could look out in this very small courtyard. People were coming, going, and Srila Prabhupada would ask, oh, is that a devotee doing? What does he do? So I had to give account of every devotee in the temple, their 24-hour activities. He expected that of the leaders. Not only just of the leaders. Uh, one time Jamuna, I'll get finished the story. One time Jamuna and Madhira, they were talking to Srila Prabhupada and, uh, in the Tordamal Lane and uh, <clears throat> The, they were saying, well, Jumuna said, uh, oh, you know, Prabhupada, that's someone else's job. And Srila Prabhupada said, are we a bureaucracy? <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so uh, then uh, I thought, well, you know, do this. So Harishari Prabhu came in and he, he said, what, what are you doing? And he reported back now, Harishari Prabhu is my good friend. Very sweet devotee. But sometimes he will say something in a little bit more splashy way than it might be. I don't know what he told Srila Prabhupada. And he came back in and he says, Srila Prabhupada wants to see you at once. <laughs> Mother Prabhupada said. So I came in and Srila Prabhupada said, he asked me what I was doing. And I related that I, I didn't relate the past events, but I related that. Uh, he had asked me to give a talk and that I didn't know many of the specific words in Telugu, so I was just randomly looking up the words. So this is what I told him exactly. And Sri the Prophet said, no. He said, we are not professional speakers. We must simply speak from the heart. So this is not the only instruction in this matter. <laughs> there were many others that compliment and that. So, and then he said, anyway, uh, take note, I give you the outline of the lecture. Then he started, you know, that quote from the Bhagavatam that there are moving and non-moving species. And he, he gave me the outline of this really academic intellectual left, and for these villagers, you know. So, anyway. so whenever I speak, Every single time I speak, besides other instructions that come to my mind, I, I'm always flooded with different instructions. Then I remember that. 
then I think, you know, for what purpose am I on this throne? Am I to be looking just like some big orangutan here and, you know, just for entertainment? Or what purpose do I have? Not just when I'm on this seat or when we talk to someone. And that should be somehow or other about Krishna consciousness. <clears throat> so, today's theme um, will be in relationship to the second prayer that we say to Srila Prabhupada several times a day. Someone wants to recite it slowly, very slowly. Namaste. Yes, slight, loud, loud, and word by word. Namaste, Sarasate, Gauravani, Devi. Oh, oh, sorry. Devi. Come on, take the camera off. Gauravani, Jami, Nidhi, 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 Nidhi. So these two words are the center of that prayer. Nirvisesha, Sunyavadi. On the basis of the mercy of Lord Sri Krishna Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. But it's not just uh, America and the Western countries that is inundated with these two qualities of Nidvisesha and Sunyavadi, but it's the whole world that is uh, inundated, inundated. And actually the whole material existence is Nirvashesha and Sunyavadi. So I, I thought to take the theme about Sunyavadi and how and discuss along with that uh, the, uh, the, the specific uh, uh, charm of the uh, appearance in this material world of such a great personality as Sri A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami Prabhupada. Actually, normally this day is a day that I hide out. I, I, I didn't, don't like to deal with this day. I've gotten a lot better over the years. <clears throat> when that film was first made of Sri Prabhupada's departure, there's no way I could see it. I, I did not want to confront the reality for me uh, that uh, Srila Prabhupada had uh, departed. <clears throat> I'll give uh, a narration about my uh, last experience with Srila Prabhupada, which occurred um, sometime, I think, the 11th of October, 1977, which was approximately, did I get the year right? 1977? Yes. I didn't say 1997. So it, it was approximately a month before Srila Prabhupada's actual departure from this material world. And uh, I had not seen him for a few months, and I was in the Hyderabad farm. And like, like other temples, we got the broadcast that Srila Prabhupada was most likely going to be leaving this material world and uh, that he wanted his disciples, as many as possible, to come and get association before uh, he wanted to do that. Mahams and I and a few of the other devotees uh, from the Hyderabad farm, we jumped in an ambassador car. <laughs> very trustworthy car, keeps on going. Uh, no matter how many times you have to repair it, which is frequent, so it runs and runs. Not like the Energizer Bunny, like a triple Energizer Bunny. So we drove up non-stop, we took turns driving day and night, and we reached, and uh, you know, the, the atmosphere, there were many devotees there, although I came to learn later that it was not so encouraged in the West, uh, you know, the devotees, you know, who had, especially those, at least should have been those who had done valorous service, uh, or, you know, some that they should have been facilitated, but not so many even knew about it. I mean, they knew, but they didn't know the, the call that they should go. But uh, 
So I'm sure the problem is there, and I, you know, when I finish this book on Sri the Prabhupada, I'm going to revise it. It's part of a series to make it part of a series of another book, series of books, which is the Reluctant Mendicant series. And so the second is the Reluctant Disciple, and that would be the title for the persons who are not so close yet to the Krishna consciousness movement. And those who are ready, it will be good for them. A little trim down all the little bit more serious discussions and the strong events will be removed. This would be more palatable. I was always the reluctant disciple that I, I, when I came in contact with the movement and I came to learn of Srila Prabhupada, and I've mentioned this before, that I thought, oh, you know, this is a person like Madhavacharya, Srila Ramanujacharya, and <laughs> there's no, no way that I would be qualified to be a, a devotee, what to speak, a disciple of this person. But chance was there, faith was there, the mercy of Rupa <coughs> then I became a disciple, and I, then I wanted to avoid Srila Prabhupada, because I thought it would only open up the path to offenses. So I thought, serve in distance, Serve the order faithfully and no, you know. And when the chance came to meet him, I sent everybody else and remained not behind in Buffalo. And then all of a sudden, Shri Prabhupada called me to India. Listen, I'll come back to that. So when I came to Vrindavan, I saw so many devotees that wanted to be with Shri Prabhupada. That's fine, I'm happy. And so I, I, I didn't even introduce myself that I had come. Because his state externally was not good, and he wanted to just be focusing. And he was still, I observed how he was still uh, translating. Uh, Pradumya Prabhu would be there, and I invite this one, and others. And they would read the verse in Sanskrit. And then Srila Prabhupada, even in that condition, not being able to look at the book, and they, he might ask some questions. And he was giving, that's the uh, Brahma. Also, Lila, that he was giving that. He was so lucid and clear. He was giving those translations and purposes. In that condition, he was skin and bones. His skin was just literally hanging on his body. He was not eating. He had not really even sipped water hardly for six months and not eaten solid food. So that was his condition. And I, myself, I was very, even though I had open gate to him, I thought, you know, oh, everybody else wants to be near him, that's nice. So, and let them be, and I'll just be there. So then, all of a sudden, uh, one devotee was leaving. I'd sit in the room, you know, even everybody left. I sat there most of the day, just listening to the kirtan. One devotee with cartels very softly was chanting. To so, one of my god brothers, he was there chanting to Sri Prophet. And then all of a sudden, he came to me and says, I have to go, and he gave me the cartels. And there was a schedule that the person had to come. So I thought, oh, what to do? So I started to chant, and it, after the first Maha Mantra, all of a sudden, I heard Srila Prabhupada, I saw him moving his lips, and so I leaned in very close, and he says, now I want to leave this world. And I was thinking, oh, oh you know. Uh -huh. But of course, I knew that, you know, even though when I chant Hare Krishna, it must be a wretched experience for the hearer, <laughs> still Krishna's name is nice. <laughs> I can't ruin that. But I, of course, you know, Sri the Prophet has his own mind. But I had little doubt. So then I called everyone, and there's that whole thing in the, the Lamant, uh, they came and two groups formed. Some said, Sri the Prophet, you want to go, please go. And some groups said, no, Srila Prabhupada, without you, we're finished. How would the movement go on? So Prabhupada said, uh, I was just there, but in, in, invisible. Srila Prabhupada said, no, you, you amongst yourselves, you go, you meet, you discuss. And there were two camps, really. Kirtananda Swami was the one who was, you stay, and Brahmananda Swami, uh, amongst others. I think tomorrow, I don't remember what camp tomorrow was in. So he was the one, Srila Prabhupada, we need you. 
do you want to go? That is your sweet will. We'll carry on. And I think tomorrow is also in that camp, all the words you probably will manage. And he said, you meet amongst yourselves, you tell me your decision, and then I will decide. I will put it up to Krishna. So they came back after some hour, and Kirtananda Swami was the one to convey the uh, decision to Srila Prabhupada. That, Srila Prabhupada, we would like you to stay. Then Srila Prabhupada closed his eyes. He, you know, he went like that. And then he says, okay, I will stay. Of course, then there was a wonderful response from all the devotees. Then immediately, immediately, Srila Prabhupada said, since I'm going to stay, then I need to eat something. So what should I eat? So I was, I, I had moved back, as far back I was actually in the servants' quarters, but I, it, it was so quiet, you could hear everything. Everyone was so quiet. Then, uh, I didn't say anything, but in my mind, I, you know, my experience with Srila Prabhupada over some six and a half years, and being his assistant, you know, to me, Srila Prabhupada was asking, you know, that he wanted to eat something for some purpose. And Kirtananda Swami immediately said, Srila Prabhupada, we have these strawberries from New Vrindavan. They had brought it and kept it in the refrigerator, but Srila Prabhupada was eating nothing, so he wasn't eating juices or anything. And utilitarian Srila Prabhupada said, so, what is the use of eating the strawberries? What is the use? What is the use? Then I, well, I thought, you know. Then they were all telling him this and that and this and that. And so I saw, oh, you know, I don't want to be visible, but I have to come out of my hiding. And I said, I sent a message to the Lord. You tell the mall to explain to Srila Prabhupada that strawberries are high in fructose. Fructose gives immediate energy to the body. So the message got passed, and then Jamal Krishna, who is very interesting amongst our devotees, for some reason or other, he says, Tejas says. <laughs> <laughs> so it might be that he was covering his track, or because this is known as the living encyclopedia. For whatever reason, he said that. And he said, Tejas says that strawberries are high in sugar, and will give you so some moderate change was there. Then Srila Prabhupada, he actually opened his eyes a bit and he says, oh, Tejas is here. And I thought, oh, you know, I've been trying to be invisible here and not disturb him. Because uh, even though I had free access to Srila Prabhupada, I was always concerned, you know, he is such an important person, has such important things on his mind. Well, I don't want to be a disturbance. So then Srila Prabhupada said, oh, what news, Tejas? What news of the Hyderabad farm? So I related to him what we were growing, and when I said that we were growing corn, oh, Srila Prabhupada said, oh, and he, I is where he says, corn, oh, this is very nice. You pound it, and the big pieces, the pot. So you boil the pot, you make the corn pot. You say pot, the, like the rice pot. Not for corn. No, but. Yeah, yeah, but. But, the word. Yeah, but Prabhupada used it for corn. Meaning, like, you could also, from wheat, you could make some, like, cereal, you know, the big pieces. And with the powder, you make these rotis. And the villagers will like them very much. And then Srila Prabhupada said this, his, his words, his, his. The sweetness with which he said they would like it very much. I, I thought, here is a person, so grand a person, for six months he's not eating. He's hardly drinking water. But in his, I excuse the term because it's not appropriate, in his deathbed, because we say his departure time, he's thinking about other people eating. <laughs> what, what kind of superlative person is this? It wasn't the first time. So that was my last experience. Shortly after that, I packed up and I went back to the Hyderabad farm because Srila Prophet said he was going to stay. And I thought, well, you know, I should be useful. <laughs> what is my use? What that I am doing? 
So I wanted to talk about this personalism of Srila Prabhupada and his great affection towards all of human beings. Uh, two incidents come to mind from that same room in Vrindavan. There are many incidents, but two. Uh, they're both very similar, but they're a little dissimilar. So the first incident, uh, outside of the room, there were some, what do you call these yellow flowers? No, the little yellow flowers. The marigolds? Marigolds, sorry. So the, outside there were some marigolds, they're easy to grow, there were some bushes. And I, Srila Prabhupada's torture to me was to make me sit by his side. I always like to sit outside of the room. Um, I, he never asked me where I was, but I always I knew he wanted me to be listening. So I would be normally in Vrindavan, we, the, outside the room there's the servants' quarters. So I would put my head through that Sri Prabhupada would see me, and then I would sit so outside. So I could listen, but without him having to see this inauspicious face. So then, you know, Srila Prabhupada would conspire and make me sit by his side and very embarrassing. But it was nice, I mean, very nice to be next to Srila Prabhupada. And I could see him by the side and see everybody in the room. It was good ringside seat, you know. And I actually sit slightly behind him. So he could still see me and turn to me if he wanted to talk to me. So all of a sudden, from Srila Prabhupada's perspective on his left hand, at the end of the room was the entrance to his room, and his middle-aged Mataji came in with a very tattered, not tattered, but very old sari. You can see she was not, she was in a very you know, humble state of condition. And in her, in her hand was this marigold, which probably, most probably, she had just plucked from outside the garden, you know, so it wasn't something she purchased. And between her eyes and uh, Srila Prabhupada, she was posing it, you know, like an offering. You know. And, you know, in India, the, the etiquette is you don't step over somebody's, you don't step over anything. You don't touch anything with your leg. Even material things like you don't push a bucket unless you're not physically capable. And, it's excusable, but the, the Paramatma is in everything, so we don't, and those was the Atma, and living beings. So, we were very careful, and she came all the way to the front, kind of disrupting everything. Sri the Prophet went on talking, and then all of a sudden she presented the marigold to Sri the Prabhupada, and he took it, and it was like he had received, like a precious gift, he looked at it, and put it through his nose, and her miracles don't have a delightful fragrance. So, but he, he breathed it in deeply, and smelled it, and said, thank you very much. So this is the, the characteristic of a person who is so pure, so Krishna conscious, always very grateful, even for the smallest, smallest service. So we're talking about personalism, how personal Srila Prabhupada is, and along with personalism, uh, has to exist kindness, gratitude, pure and soft-hearted. So these, these all are the cluster of that quality of personalism. Uh, we were in the Calcutta airport, Dum Dum. At that time it was tiny, really tiny. The whole airport is smaller, half the size of this, uh, I mean, the terminal is half the size of this room. And uh, every person Srila Prabhupada encountered, he treated them like they were, to him, the, maybe you could say, the most important person. To paraphrase it in the opposite, to Srila Prabhupada there was no one who was insignificant. Because if we think people are insignificant, they're disposable, what the heck, who would care, you know, 
Well, this is a manifestation of impersonalism. But personalism is every single person is important. Not because we filter it through our brain that they're part of Krishna, but we actually experience, and a person like Srila Prabhupada experiences it on the highest possible uh, status that everyone, to him, not that they were, of course, that was also in his consciousness, that, but, but he, he thought he found delight in everyone. So, just this person who was examining his bag and all of a sudden Srila Prabhupada is talking to him like an old friend. He, he didn't know him because he asked his name. So, so many things we used to observe. The question is, you know, the begin, is that there is the book Bhagavata, we say, correct? This is the incarnation of the Lord in, uh, in today, we call it written form, a manifestation, because initially it was not written, it's a sound form. So the person, the, the, the personality, the Supreme Personality of Godhead, in this Kali Yuga, incarnates in this Srimad Bhagavata. Uh, and, but, in a sense, equally, or maybe sometimes more important to us, as we're in this prayer that we send, Shakshad Hari, Tvenasana in a sense, especially for this Krishna Consciousness movement, the person, Bhagavat, is, brings it all home for us. So, the study of Srila Prabhupada is not just a collection of fascinating stories. Well, that's of course delightful. Like, you know, if we hear the stories of Krishna, the purifiers of heart, if we hear the pastimes of the exalted pure devotees of Krishna, and that's throughout the Bhagavatam. Bhagavatam is more the stories of the devotees of Krishna than Krishna, except when you reach the Dasam standard. Then it's purely about Krishna. But even there, most of it is about Krishna's devotees. So the person Bhagavat is to have that experience or to hear from those who had that experience, to understand in person what is exceptional, what is exceptional. <clears throat> One time uh, Srila Prabhupada was talking to this Mataji who used to create quite a disturbance in Delhi. Uh, this is a rotten, not rotten, like spoiled, is a Punjabi name, Haratan. And uh, Srila Prabhupada, even, he took everybody nicely. And he brought me, Shri, this lady brought before Srila Prabhupada her daughter who was working on Air India. So immediately you understand Air India, you know, they're serving liquor, they're serving meat. She might even have been eating meat. Maybe, maybe not. Uh, but Shula, she said, Srila Prabhupada, this is my daughter, please you kindly give her mercy. And uh, she has brought this chocolate and you give her initiation, you take her as your disciple. <laughs> so, then Srila Prabhupada says, yes, of course. And then he didn't ask her any questions. And then he, he took the beads in his hand. And uh, I can demonstrate because I have beads here. And he took his beads, they were small, they were the, you know, little neem, or they might have been Tulsi, but they were very small. So Srila Prabhupada held them up in his right hand and put out his left hand and drizzled them into his left hand. Then he picked them up from his left hand and drizzled them into his right hand and he handed her the beads and he said, Your name is. <laughs> so this is the extension of kindness always kind. There was a gathering of devotees, the leaders of this Khan and Srila Prabhupada's room, and they were discussing a problem devotee. I won't mention his name because it's, it might taint the way you think about him, and uh, he's written some books, he's a very sweet devotee. He had his problems, and he had stolen from the BBT $25,000. This was in 1972. Wow. Mm, that's a lot of money. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, we have limited time, so I can't elaborate. But to Srila Prabhupada, every paisa was important. One time he sent me 
some 13 times to the State India Bank in um, M block, K block, M block, yeah, K block. That was where we had our bank because they had charged us three rupees for a transaction fee. And, you know, so three, I went there some 13 times and, you know, they were, they had, they were handicapped. Eventually I got them to just give a donation. <laughs> He said, the principle is that every paisa should have brought a used to watch. But when it, this is, this is a story that's opposite of that. So, just to understand. So, but what Prabhupada was annoyed with was that he took that money and then he invested in some jewels, jewel, jewel, jewelry business, not jewelry business, but looking for gems, gem business. And then he lost all the money and he did this more than once and he promised through the Prabhupada that he would pay it back and then the history repeated itself. And, you know, he was one of the original disciples and Prabhupada had a very affectionate relationship with himself, that devotee and his wife and his daughter, very affectionate. And uh, then uh, he did it a third time, not just once, not just twice, three times he took money and spoiled it all, BBT money or temple money. Which is, you're not supposed to take a paisa, I mean, goodness, you know, you know, they, you know Prabhupada will, I mean, you know. But this, this is, uh, explains the other side, so, so the, the devotee, the, the GBC, who is in charge of India, and some of the other seniors, Srila Prabhupada's ser servant and secretary, GBC secretary, they, they were asking Srila Prabhupada, you know, this is going on, this devotee, you love him very much, and he, you're a dear servant, but you know, he keeps on doing this. You know, and he, he your, your kindness, your open-heartedness, your forgiveness is encouraging him to do this, because, you know, if a person doesn't get punished, they'll do it again. They think it's, you know, all right. And Prabhupada said, no, no. He said, he's come to me, and he has asked me, in a very sincere and humble way, to give him forgiveness. So the devotees, they, they were little, because in the end that comes back down on them. So they were thinking, you know, they're caught in between, so you know, no one can blame them for asking these questions. So the problem, but there has to be an end to this. They weren't rude. They were just, as administrators, that they would actually have to pick up the ball, you know, where's that 25,000 to come back from, you know. So they were responsible. So they said, Sri Prabhupada, there has to be an end to this. You, know, but you have to stop forgiving him because it sends the wrong message. And Sri Prabhupada said, No. He came to me. He asked forgiveness. And I gave it. And I will give it again and again and again and again. I will go on forgiving. So to read it in the you know, paper is one thing, but to actually see, to experience, you know, this, many sides of Srila Prabhupada. You know, one paisa, forget it, you know, ho, 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 ho. Uh, this, uh, but at the same time, Srila Prabhupada was conscious of one thing more than anything, and always above that was his guideline of, you know, everybody was important to him. The thing that almost annoyed me the most, I can't, don't know what correct, irked me the most about my relationship with Sri the Prophet and serving him directly, is a very peculiar thing. Because I had the, the desire that I be, you know, a good servant. You know, what do they say about children? They used to say, they should. Seen and not heard? Yes. Well, you know, a good servant should be like that. Maybe not even seen. First class servant, you don't have to tell them anything, it's already done. Rich people, when they go traveling, I was reading some documentaries, this lady was saying how she married this very famous guy, and she would, well, the thing that amazed the most, wherever she'd go, you know, the whole, she would land up in some hotel, and everything was arranged, just like their home, so convenient. So a first class servant, understands and anticipates the needs of the master. In a way, the master never has to tax their brain. <clears throat> so,
So uh, I always wanted to be that little bit like that kind of servant, not in a great way, but to, you know. But then I was put in this position by Srila Prabhupada, to, he asked me to come in his room, and he came to Delhi 18 times. Well, I was there 18 times, and he called me. That's a lot, you know. I was thinking, what well, we you know? It's a lot of times. 18 times. He stayed with me, just to be with me 77 days. Then he called me another 48 times to be with him, wrote me some 90 letters of instructions. And you know, for me, I'm just not even significant. I'm not even insignificant. It's just, I had my service, and I got in this situation by the mercy of the devotees, and then through the prophet, so I was very lucky, you know. But uh, you know, <laughs> this is a great man, and I'm in a dangerous position, and I'm, he's staying with me, and I'm coming in the room, you know. I have business. So, but the thing that, for me, every time I came in the room, he would stop whatever he was doing, and I always hoped that he wouldn't notice me. I'd go, and I'd go against the wall, you know, and there would be groups, and I was very happy, you know. Oh, lots of devotees, I can hide out, you know. He won't notice me. And then he'd get me. One time, I, he came to Delhi, and it was a really packed room, and I had to facilitate his, his white bag. First, he had a red bag, mm -hmm. then he changed it to white, or white and red. So then, you know, I made sure that the white bag went in the right direction, because he handed it over to someone. So I had a legitimate excuse, and it was a very tiny room, like maybe a third the size of the altar. And Srila Prabhupada saw I looking from the outside, and you know, I wanted Srila Prabhupada to know that I was there, and then he, he looked and he said, and it was very, no door where he was. And so he, we put a sarai, a sarai is like this interesting looking clay pot, so keep the water cool in with a cup. It's just next to him, he said, I want a glass of water. And everyone reached, he says, no, 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 that table, I want that. <laughs> so he would like, and I think, oh, no, you know, it's like this. It's like, mm -hmm. yeah, I just want to know. Uh, so every time, and one time I was very lucky. Not, there were two times. One time was really sad, and I won't talk about it. Probably was really sad. One, one time I came in the room, and he had a book in his hand. And he was leaning over that book. His, he would wear his glasses down on his nose because they weren't like really special prescription glasses. And, and he was reading and he ignored me when I came in the room. Otherwise, immediately he says, Ah, oh, Tejas, Tejas, Maharaj, Tejas, what news? Like, sometimes five minutes before I had come in and then I come back to report and he says, Ah, oh, Tejas, what news? It's like, he hadn't seen me in five years, what news? So I came in the room and I was so happy he ignored me and I sat against the wall just watching him devouring that book, reading that book like it was the most important thing he had ever read. He was, his attention was so vivid in that book. And at first I couldn't see the title because his hand, he had taken the dust jacket off of it and his hand was covering the spine and uh, it was open. So then, after some time, he looked up at me over the top of his glasses, and he said, ah, ah. he says, I cannot believe that I have written this book. I could not have written this book. And it was nectar of devotion. So many things from this. Uh, first of all, Srila Prabhupada encouraged us, that's a mild way of putting it, to always read his books. Because there are so many things that happen by reading his books. We get the association of him directly, we, and there's an extraordinary process of purification, Srinivatam Swapada Krishna. And we also get elucidation from within the heart, the, the Supreme Lord as the Super Soul, when we conjunct with the pure devotee, gives instructions, enlightenment in the heart. So here, Srila Prabhupada, He's able to give these purports just off the top of his brain, from the heart. He's able to do it spontaneously. Words that he felt responsible should embody and emblaze the Krishna consciousness movement for the next 9,500 years. He would speak and write in such a consciousness, state of consciousness. And yet he is scrupulously studying them. And 
you can paraphrase it, he is getting benefit for his devotion. You see, the devotee, uh, a devotee never thinks, oh, no, I've become advanced. Uh oh, that's the end of it. Finished. <laughs> it's not even pride, that's already God, you know. You think that Srimati Radharani thinks, oh, I'm the best devotee of all, the mother you showed up. What to speak of Srimati Rukmini Devi? Oh my goodness. You see, and Srila Prabhupada, he, you know. He understands what he can do, he understands how he can be empowered to accomplish the will of Srila Sri Krishna Chaitanya Mahaprabhu to establish this uh, the course of this great ship uh, and that should spawn many other ships for the next 9500 years. He put all of these directions in his books, maybe not in the specific details but in the principles. And yet he is really thinking, oh, how can I become better in my Krishna consciousness. He, he, that was the very first thing when he called me in the room, he said, read to me. And what was it? Nectar of devotion. He loved hearing this book. He also loved hearing the Krishna work. So, we're out of time. Everyone to Srila Prabhupada was very significant. We should catch ourselves, you know. We're meeting someone now, you know. A mind in it goes, but no, everyone is, you know, at least we should go through the understanding that everyone is Krishna's devotee, you know, and they're just forgotten. You know, this unfortunate position. And we are so fortunate that we've come to this uh, great opportunity, this movement that was presented, being presented in this organization of Krishna consciousness. So, Jai Srila Prabhupada. Hare Krishna. We have some flowers to give out from the Garden of Eden. Krishna Gardens. Some fantastic thing is happening, you know, as the, I'm growing these roses. These roses, varieties that have no fragrance, there are like the drift roses, and there's a famous variety called knockout roses. No knockout rose has fragrance. Everyone knows this. But somehow or other, in the Krishna gardens, all the roses not only have fragrance, but they're radiant. And I may not see them, you probably see them better than me, because I'm familiarity, you know, breeds content, I'm around them all the time. But when I bring them out and I just open the box, everybody in the room, they're just like, whoa, what is that? You know? And then when I say, here's a rose, I said, it comes from, I'm a cultivar of Rama roses. <laughs> oh, Rama rose. <laughs> Shama, this one is Shama. Oh, that's a Krishna rose. And they're smelling the prasadam, and people become so joyous, so joyous. Just a small thing, huh? A little prasadam, hearing Krishna's name. There's so much potency. There's so many wonderful, sweet people out there in our environment. I, I think, you know, I was thinking of it a little more, I was, myself and Maya were, were talking to these two girls in Coles, you know, and they were so nice, and my experience, there's so many potential persons here, at least I would say 10, 25,000, maybe many more within not a very long distance, who are just so ready to get the enlightenment of Krishna consciousness, so right. Not that this movement the potential is God, but it's so right, you know, so right, you know, people. But we just have to know how to make it a contemporary presentation, the perfect old wine. You can't change that wine in a, in a slightly new bottle. Jai Shri Prabhupada. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna.